here we are, ladies and gentlemen, I do believe, at the house at Pooh Corner with Jim Hogue. And your guest today is Matthew Krupp, and he is an expert on credit unions. And we're going to be finding out today what a credit union is, what credit unions do, and maybe what they can do and don't. And that'll take up uh, a, a while. And then I will be grilling him um, because he's told me he has his crystal ball here. And we're going to be looking into the future of credit unions having to do with perhaps uh, cryptocurrencies, digital currencies, uh, other alternative currencies. And so I'm looking forward to that because uh, my crystal ball tells me that it's going to be a very difficult haul to try to get an alternative currency as a major currency in the state of Vermont. And I would love to find out from Matt what he thinks is possible in that realm. But let's start out with the simple stuff. What is a credit union and what does it do? And Matt, please tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your studies, your, your drift into monetary reform, because we met many, many years ago having to do with a state bank, I believe. And um, so you'll tell us where, where your studies have led you. So take it away, Matt Krupp. Well, thanks for having me here, Jim. And uh, yeah, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm so, I mean, maybe to start, you know, just what a credit union is, is it, you know, at its core, a consumer cooperative financial institution. So, you know, uh, something that when I first learned about them, it was almost by accident. Um, uh, back during the 2008 financial crisis, I was reading some article and, and it mentioned credit unions. And the, the idea of a, a bank that's owned by its customers was like, like mind blowing to me. Um, and so I kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole learning about them because it was, it was kind of funny. I, I found out after the fact that um, back in the 60s, my grandfather had been um, the treasurer for like a small teacher's credit union in Kansas. Um, but just it had never clicked to me that that was anything really to be aware of or, you know, it's just sort of a little side job that he had had, not something that was connected to anything larger. Um, but so, so they had really been flying under the radar and things have there's been some interesting kind of structural changes over the years, but at its core, the idea of a credit union is, um, you know, a, a financial institution owned by by its members. Um, and one of the other kind of key things that really drove, drove them early on, and we'll talk about the sort of how they've changed over time, um, is that they they initially were were connected to specific communities that were referred to as the, the credit union's common bond. And in the, the time before you had things like credit scores or in other kind of kind of quasi-objective tricks for allocating credit and loans, um, you know, the fact that you were going to the, the credit union for your loan meant that you were your loan was coming from the savings of, say, fellow members of your church or people who worked in the same workplace as you or something like that, um, which created this sort of social capital and, and a level of kind of um, give and take and trust that would be, you know, would not exist in a larger financial institution, which on the one hand meant that, you know, you'd elect a board or a credit committee from among that community um, who would have the sort of social knowledge to be like, okay, yeah, you, you know, if we give you a loan to buy a car, or to, you know, you know, buy some Christmas presents as for the holidays or something like that. Um, you know, we, we believe that you'll pay it back. You know, we know you've got, you know, you've got a job. We know you've got good character, all of that. And then on the flip side, even if someone was kind of going through times, they'd be less likely to simply default because it wasn't just a commodity relationship of, you know, this investor owned bank, which is seeking to make money, made me a loan. Now I'm, you know, bankrupt. I'm going to default. People sort of recognize this came from their neighbors or their, Per fellow parishioners' savings, and even if they couldn't pay it now, you know there, there was some sense of moral moral obligation to do so. So, so that kind of two way street of you know the community again saying, oh, this person had a terrible accident. Okay, we're going to write off the loan because we know that you know it would be socially harmful to kind of collect on it. Um, but at the same time, that person maybe five or ten years later. There's plenty of examples of them being like, oh, I was ready to check for $5 every month, even when they didn't have to because they, they felt that, that sense of it as a community institution. So early credit unions really grew up around these sorts of small common bonds. They were little 
organizations, a few hundred people maybe. Um, you know, there were some that were bigger. You know, certainly kind of the municipal credit union in New York City had early on tens of thousands of members. But the average credit union was small, and credit unions kind of grew, um, you know, extensively, right? So, so through the creation of more credit unions rather than consolidation or making credit unions bigger. Um, so that sort of shifted around the end of the 1960s. When um, you know, in the 1930s, the the um, uh, FDIC was created, Federal Deposit Insurance, uh, that said that if a bank failed, uh, the federal government or a deposit, a federally kind of managed deposit insurance pool that all the banks paid into would would cover the um, would cover the losses. So in the credit union system, they were initially mostly small consumer loans. Um, they um, and so and there's a lot of regulatory stuff that kind of compartmentalized up until the late 70s what sorts of lending different kinds of financial institutions could do. It was around 1980 that that a lot of those were lifted as part of the kind of the sort of banking reforms and general sort of shift to the neoliberal era that happened around kind of Carter Reagan. Um, But so it was really the compartmentalization was banks were the ones that did, you know, commercial lending, you know, might do some mortgages, things like that. Um, you know, savings and loans were a whole separate category that was really about sort of home lending, mortgages, that sort of thing. And then credit unions were the sort of smaller institutions that were, you know, providing the sort of credit that folks now might kind of have a credit card for, you know, the smaller consumer credit, maybe buying a car, that sort of thing. Um, But so around in the 1960s, there was a big debate in the credit union world around um, whether credit unions should also have federal deposit insurance. And the sort of two sides of the argument were, on the one hand, you know, banks had it, they were consolidating, it was really, if people were thinking, where do I keep my savings, do I keep it in the place that if the institution fails, the federal government guarantees that I get my money back, or do I keep it in the small, you know, semi-professional or even non-professional community institution that doesn't have that guarantee, you know, there's definitely kind of like a shift of capital towards those insured institutions. But on the other hand, there is kind of the, the argument that, that you know, with that insurance comes a lot of regulatory burden, and it would sort of shift the character of credit unions away from kind of community control and being accountable to, you know, the, those founding common bond communities to the regulatory structure. Um, and so it kind of went back and forth around 1970. The, um, the national, uh, was it the, the, Regulator for credit unions had moved through between a few different federal agencies, um, uh, but the NCUA, um, uh, the National Credit Union Administration, was created as the sort of permanent home for the regulatory body and the, the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund, which is parallel to the FDIC and has many similar characteristics, but it's you know its own separate pool of money from the bank's insurance fund was created, and that's the time you see the inflection point where. You know, the number of credit union members continue to grow, the amount of assets continue to grow, but that, the peak of number of credit unions, and from then there's been this kind of, this uh, consolidation trend that's happened. Um, And so, you know, really from 1970 to the present, you see sort of mergers, you know, the professionalization, um, and really, and, you know, having, again, those regulators who demand a certain level of professionalization, um, and from a regulatory perspective, it's easier to regulate a few large institutions that are highly professionalized than many small institutions that are, you know, being run by people like my grandfather who have another full-time job and they're kind of doing this as almost community service, um, where they might get a small token paycheck, but it's definitely a side side job, not a main career focus. Um, and so that's really kind of driven, you know, the that has along with some of the larger sort of financial sector dynamics is what's kind of driven the development of what the current credit union system looks like now, which is, you know, you have a few credit unions that are quite large, you know, 10 billion plus in assets. Um, And then you have this kind of a lot of still more local ones, but um, oftentimes credit unions that are made up of, you know, five, 10, 15, um, 15 organizations, you know, common bond credit unions that have just merged in the past 40 years, um, which has definitely sort of meant that there's, you know, there's been more, um, you know, the, the, the kind of center of gravity and identity um, in that sense of kind of social accountability that defined early credit unions. 
much more rare now because, again, they're using credit scores. They're using very similar sort of approaches to banks. They still have the cooperative structure, so, so there aren't profits going to shareholders. The profits are being returned to members through better, better rates on savings and on, you know, and on loans. Um, but the, the kind of cultural um, and process aspect has kind of, you know, converged as, you know, especially post-1980, all of the different types of financial institutions were allowed to kind of encroach on each other's turf. So that's kind of the, you know, the thumbnail sketch of the development of the, the credit union movement to today. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And I have come up with a lot of questions for you in the meantime. Uh, the first one is, what's the difference between a federal credit union and a credit union that is not a credit mm -hmm. union, call it a state credit union or, or whatever? Yep. So uh, basically, it's it's who charters the um, the institution. So either a credit union can be chartered by the federal government, which makes it a federal credit union, or it can be chartered by a state. Um, and so early on, uh, like say in the 1920s when the credit union movement was really getting going, um, the you know the, the, a lot of the there's a lot of activity and you know there's a concerted push to get laws enabling laws for credit unions. And so a lot of so a lot of states pass those enabling laws, um, and then in the course of a, maybe a decade, and so a lot of credit unions were started under those state charters. And then in 1934, the Federal Credit Union Act was passed, kind of in the midst of a lot of different New, New Deal, you know, Great Depression stuff. That then meant that you could incorporate a credit union anywhere in the United States. It didn't have to be in the thing at the at that point. It was maybe two thirds of states had had. Credit union enabling acts at that point. So that's the sort of background of the the two charter system. Both types of credit unions can um, become members of the the um, the insurance fund. Federal credit unions have to. Um, state credit unions. It's dependent on each state's laws. Most states require that um, that they do. I believe it's like Ohio and maybe one or other two other states do allow state charter credit unions to choose to not be be. Um, federally insured, which gives them a bit more autonomy. Um, so in those states, there's actually, you know, I think there's there's like one or two left. There used to be a lot of them, um, but there's like one or two left kind of private insurance funds that the that they can, that some of them will join instead. So, so if they fail, it's covered out of that private insurance, but it's not backed by the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, so, and there, and there definitely is some, some kind of little nuances and things about, you know, the, you know, the whole sort of laboratories of democracy of states thing, um, of different credit unions. Uh, state credit union enabling acts having different things that credit unions are allowed to do. Mm -hmm. So, like one of the big points of contention, for instance, um, among among banks and credit unions is sort of related to that 1980 era, you know, fed financial deregulation, where you know credit unions started to be allowed to encroach in on banks' turf and in say mortgage lending and business lending in particular, um, and vice versa, you know, banks were allowed to sort of encroach more into that small lending as credit cards became more common, et cetera. Um, but so so one of the things that there's often a sort of struggle over is, on the one hand, because they're, they're you know, cooperatives that operate on a not-for-profit basis, um, credit unions don't have to pay sort of federal corporate income tax, um, which pisses off the banks. Mm. Um, but credit unions are also limited to lending no more than 12.25% of their assets to be to businesses, so the vast majority of their lending has to be to individual consumers, um, which the credit unions obviously that limits what they're able to do and limits competition to the to the banks. So, oftentimes, like those are kind of the back and forth of oh, credit unions should be should be taxed more, or uh, credit unions should be given more the ability to sort of you know compete more completely with with banks. Um, but so one example, one interesting little example and. And Vermont is one of a handful of states that has a, um, has a sort of line in their credit union, state credit union and lending acts that allows for state chartered credit unions equity investments in other cooperatives. So, so that doesn't count towards business lending. That counts towards, you know, if it's a consumer co-op, like a food co-op or a worker cooperative that's being converted from a conventional business or, you know, any other forms of cooperatives, they're allowed to sort of deploy some of their capital as kind of equity investments. Um, in a way that doesn't count towards their business lending cap, and so that's one of those things where there's you know other little little things like that 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 mean there's some some diversity in what state chartered credit unions are allowed 
are sort of allowed to do beyond the sort of the, the vanilla federal credit union charter model that's fairly standardized no matter where you are. Okay. Well, that opens up uh, more questions. Now, when you use the word equity investment, mm -hmm. is that's not a straight substitute for the word loan, is it? Does it? Nope. Does the, so what is it if, if, a, if the Vermont Credit Union, the one I'm in, uh, which is a state credit union, right, but also federal or? Which, uh, which credit union are you in? VC, V, uh, Employee State Credit Union. Yep, VSCCU. That's a state credit union. Yep, that's a state credit union okay. whose, so whose common they, bond is currently the, the whole state of Vermont. Yeah. So if they make an equity investment in a food co-op, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So um, so they are actually the one of the few few credit unions in the country that has a co-op equity investment program. It's called Co-op Capital. Um, there's a page on their website if anyone out there is interested in checking checking out the details. Um, but basically, uh, if you're to you know a cooperative, generally to, to back up a moment is you know it's a an organization that exists to operate on a not-for-profit basis towards its members, right? So it's not a non-profit in the way that something like you know the public access station that you're broadcasting from is is a nonprofit or you know a public you know so it's operates in business it generates revenue and it aims to generate a surplus um but the the goal is that it then returns the surplus to its members prorated by their use of the co-op so in a consumer co-op right if i buy a thousand dollars of groceries and you buy two thousand dollars worth of groceries you know and at the end of the year there's a profit the the patronage refund the return of that profit you would get twice as much as i would get um and so because of that right you're you're getting a return on use not a return on capital um sort of what, what when you think of traditional equity investment it's i buy 10 percent of a company and i get 10 percent of the profit mm -hmm. that doesn't work for co-ops so the two ways that investment in co-ops can happen is one is debt you know i make for instance my food co-ops in burlington city market recently expanded and they they wanted to fund part of it through kind of member direct member investment. So they said, we're going to issue bonds, essentially. And co-op members can buy the bonds. They'll pay a little bit of interest. And after seven years or 10 years, the principal will be paid back. Um, and you know, you'll go on. So that's that's one way. The other way um, is through what's called non-voting preferred shares. And you know, so one of the core co-op principles is one member, one vote. Um, and so, so we, can't have something where someone comes in and invests additional capital, has additional governance power. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a democracy. Democracy is at the core of the co-op model. And so these non-voting preferred shares behave in some ways like debt, but are more patient. So essentially, you you know say buy a share for $100. Um, the first slice of profits before you return profits to the members kind of as patronage, maybe with a target return of, call it 5 or 6%, um, goes to those preferred shareholders. And then the rest of the profit goes to the goes to the members um, and so so that sort of so it could be something where you know the credit union could be joining as a as a you know co as a just a member of the co-op and that would be equity but it could also be buying those non-voting preferred shares as kind of a patient social investment in cooperatives okay well thank you I um, I tried to follow that and I think I did um, just to double to be a little bit redundant here when I walk into the, the credit union posted on the wall, are there assets and liabilities, assets mm -hmm. being loans, liabilities being deposits. If the credit union, the, if your credit union, for example, makes an equity investment in a local co-op, mm -hmm. where does that go on the balance sheet? How does that work and where does it come from reserves? Mm -hmm. or yeah, just, yeah. Well, of course, ban oh, sorry to interrupt, but banking, and and credit co-op credit union lending um, doesn't come from deposits. It, it it comes from, if you will, thin air. It's based on deposits and reserves, but it's created money. Um, with a savings and loan, that's not the case. The savings and loan lends out the actual money, and mm -hmm. maybe that's one reason why savings and loans don't work anymore. Uh, also, there was. You know, this, this game. There's a lot of fraud in the yeah. 80s. <laughs> um, so anyway, where if you're looking at a bank balance sheet, this is getting really wonky, people, so I'm sorry about that. Um, if you look at a bank balance sheet, the um, equity position that the credit union takes 
in the co-op would be mm -hmm. on that would be an asset. their asset side. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got and it. the other thing to think about, because again, sort of when you think about what is the, the equity of the, of the credit union, um, you know, unlike a bank, which can sell those kind of common, you know, those common investor shares on the stock market or what have you to sort of build the, the equity that sort of allows them to, you know, with the way bank regulation works, you need a certain amount of equity in order to, you know, a ratio between the, your amount of equity and the, the sort of amount of deposits you have, because um, the equity is what, you know, is, is what would be lost if the bank was failed um, and then first and then... Mm -hmm. You know, the insurance fund would bail out the rest, right? Mm -hmm. um, with a credit union, right, the equity is the member share, which is often a token amount. So, you know, 5 or $25, generally very minimal. Um, and then the other thing is retained earnings. So for because they're, they're co-ops, it's a little bit harder for them to access equity capital versus, you know, a for-profit, a traditional for-profit firm. So for many for many credit unions, the uh, sort of building of that, um, that, that sort of equity or capital base is is something that happens over time through through retained earnings. Okay. Um, but yeah, but for for those sorts of investments, yes, it would sit okay. as as an asset on the balance sheet. Yeah. So it's defined. The, the there's no difference between a credit union and say your local bank in terms of the balance sheet because their um, their reserves and their 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 assets are loans plus the lawnmowers and the, the, the building and other stuff mm -hmm. that is, and, and, and actual money that's, that is theirs. Right. Okay, got it. Yep. Um, yep. Now, um, where are we? I wrote some questions down, and I think I just covered them. Okay, oh yeah. Just to make another redundant question, a credit union works in the fractional reserve system like your local bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, yeah. So it's the sort of thing where, you know, when when you, it doesn't need to have one to one, to one cash on hand for deposits, right? You can, right. Uh, yeah, right. you, you, you take in deposits, you need to, the, the regulatory system basically sets a certain level of the, you know, how much capital you need to have versus how much mm -hmm. you can lend out right so so the more the more capital you have you can bring in more deposits you can you can lend out more money yeah and i think one of the big problems they had in cyprus was that they offered too high a return on the savings and they didn't have any loans mm -hmm. so they, they yeah. couldn't possibly <laughs> pay the the dividends on the savings and so that they they went belly up and and then in, now in Europe, they, they know they can't do that in advance, so they're actually charging people a demarrage. They're charging people a fee to take their money. Mm -hmm. So we're wondering about you know how that might play out in the United States, but we don't have to go into that unless you want to. I mean, you know, it's, it's, that gets into some of the bigger questions about you know the you know, where where you sit in the international currency system, right? Yeah. Because I think I think this is this is one of those things where you know as long as dollar hegemony is maintained, right? Mm -hmm. You know where there and there's kind of extra resources flowing flowing into the American economy and the American sort of economic system because mm -hmm. you know we're we're sort of at the center of it and we're able to collect rents off of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know things are things are you know relatively stable compared to if you're in a peripheral country in mm -hmm. the economic system where you're being extracted from and the sort of sent the, the amount of give there is before mm -hmm. before you get you, you find yourself in crisis is much much lower than it is here okay. so there's oh, yeah. definitely different dynamics there and depending on where you go online it either looks like the sky is falling because of the derivative um, situation or it looks like no problem because QE you know, one, two, three, four, five, etc., can always add to the money supply as we need it. Mm -hmm. And I gave a talk many years ago about why the U.S. gets to do that. And the main thing that I said that I very, very rarely hear anybody talk about, and that I think they should, 
is gunboat diplomacy. Mm -hmm. You either re maintain, we, we either get to maintain dollar hegemony or we'll kill you. We'll, we'll destroy your country mm -hmm. if you don't keep the oil, you know, the oil for dollar system going, we will destroy your country, which has been done, of course, several times already right. over it's, the last several years. It's, it's a more, it's a generally more subtle form of empire, but it's still a form of empire, right, where you have a periphery that's being extracted from mm -hmm. and a sort of center where sort of resources that's being overdeveloped by the sort of amount of resources or, I mean, ethically, you could even consider it plunder that's being sort of accumulated in that center. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, you know, if you look at past empires, whether that's, you know, Rome or whether that's, you know, Britain or other places. And I think Britain's an interesting one to sort of look at as kind of a slow, you know, re receding back from sort of being an imperial center mm -hmm. where there's still a fair amount of kind of, you know, the, the capital that was accumulated in the city of London and ever and uh, and in the, the society generally, you know, is something that once it's there, you know, there are certain ways of kind of locking it in. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, sort of over over time, if if the sort of central flows are going elsewhere, you know, the its general influence has been in decline. And even without the sort of self inflicted wound of Brexit, like you know, that's you know, it's this you know, it's it, it, they as a society, kind of how do you come to terms with the fact that, that you're no longer sort of the central repository of, of plunder for a, for a large portion of the world? Mm -hmm. Well, that's. If you're interested in that topic, we can do another program at, at another time um, on it because it's worth several hours of discussion on, oh, on yeah. its own. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm writing a paper now called All Wars Are Bankers' Wars, and I've gone through the – I started with the Mayflower and the loans having to do with that and right up through the Currency Act and then into the War of 1812. The war between the states, and I'm going to be touching on the Boer, Boer War, the uh, war against the Filipinos, the um, Russo-Japanese War, and then World War I, and it's a mess. But mm -hmm. if you follow the thread, which is very difficult, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for me to just open up a book and follow the thread. I'm, I'm using several different sources, and that thread always goes back to the banks, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of an interesting, it's an interesting topic. So oh, yeah. anyway, um, the, there, there's, there's a, let's switch a little bit now to the ability or the potential ability of a bank, of a credit union to, let's say, host, I don't know what the right word is, a situation like a Liberty Dollar. I just interviewed for one hour a uh, Liberty Dollar expert, and um, they they have warehouses around the country for, where they have goods. Uh, Liberty Dollars are backed by silver. And toward the end of the interview, I asked him, so what happens if Uruguay wants to switch to Liberty Dollars as their currency? And he said, all they have to do is open an account. And um, of course, that's based. That's one hour of discussion on what a Liberty Dollar is. So here you have an alternative currency that cannot be used to pay taxes or fees, mm -hmm. and it can be used in international transactions. Well, it's kind of like Amy Kirshner's credit union, actually. Uh, Amy Kirshner's uh, mutual uh, credit mutual credit system. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, only it's it's backed. Not by the, the the mutual credit system that Amy Kirshner is running. Basically, functions out of the, the dollar Federal Reserve system, um, but you don't have to spend those dollars because you're accumulating right. credit. You're, you're, you're accumulating using them as a unit of account in that case, yeah. right? For for sort of barter for valuing barter type term yeah. transactions. So I'm glad I mentioned that because I'm going to ask you about how what Amy Kirshner is doing could be helped by a credit union, how they could maybe get involved and, and become part of the exchange, or if maybe Amy is handling it so well on her own that that would become irrelevant. Um, and then how the Liberty Dollar, P 
people might become, there are liberty dollars, it's an anti-bank, but right? they call themselves the anti-bank. There's, <coughs> there's no fractional reserve, there's no lending per se, there's mutual credit, but they don't lend in the same way a bank lends or the same way that a credit union lends. So anyway, I'll throw that out there, that mess that I just said, and you can um, sort of sort it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you know, one of the things that got me interested in, you know, in this topic you know, of cooperative finance and credit unions to begin with um, was this question of um, uh, you know, what, what are the, what are the pos alternative economy possibilities that you know, a democratic member accountable financial institution could engage with that a more traditional one, you know, would, would not, right? And so, um, you know, for, before, I, before I get into what I see as the possibilities, I'll talk a little bit about what I see as the barriers to that. Because, you know, I've been kind of like thinking about that for a while. Um, you know, the first one, obviously, is um, is the question of, you know, just, you know, being, being regulated, you know, what's going to sort of set off regulatory alarm bells, which, you know, which forced them to back down. So an example of that was... Um, I think it was the founders of Wikipedia um, years ago created like kind of early in the in the Bitcoin era um, uh, created a um, uh, was it, or basically said that they were going to sort of have the they created a virtual credit union uh, um, and then would, were going to have the credit union be sort of a allow for kind of custodial accounts of cryptocurrency. Um, and this was probably like 2012, 2013, right? This very, very early in, in the sort of Bitcoin era. Um, and so they ultimately kind of ran afoul of kind of the regulators being like, what is this? We're not trying to treat this. This is, this is high risk and could create liability. And if it is high risk and could create liability, that puts the, the sort of insurance fund at risk. And that's really like their primary, the prime directive, so to speak, of the regulatory apparatus is... You know, make sure that the that the behavior of the members of the, the insurance fund aren't taking on, you know, aren't doing things that are so risky that it, it puts the share insurance fund at risk. Like derivatives. Right. <laughs> right. So so the uh, so so there's that kind of um, that barrier. Um, then the, then there's kind of the more sort of ephemeral, but kind of question of, OK, so how do you kind of take an institution that it is democratic, but you know you have a you have a elected board and everything like that. But that has competing priorities, and how do you sort of demonstrate to it that these thing that these are things that are kind of, you know, moderate risk to you and would bring sort of like meaningful benefit to their membership. Um, and I think that uh, you know in terms of credit unions that have been the most willing to be creative and give serious consideration to sort of innovative ideas in this way. You know, again, the, in terms of at least the Vermont scene, I see VSCCU as kind of head and shoulders above everyone else, right? So the, for instance, that, that co-op capital fund I mentioned came into being after um, there was a worker co-op conversion that the, the new school of Montpelier, which is kind of a special ed school, was wanting to, you know, the, the employees were seeking to buy it and turn it into, from the founder and turn it into a worker cooperative. Um, they were interested in lending, but had issues with the regulator around personal guarantees. Um, and so that the issues were then what motivated them to do the research and find this, this kind of, um, this thing in the law that no one in the credit union world had even remembered existed um, and created a new program out of it. Um, and so I think the sort of the key for these sorts of these sorts of initiatives generally would be kind of finding the ones. So something like what you know what Amy Kirshner's done with a mutual credit system, other things like that. Really find, finding those things that you could sort of demonstrate that this would advance the mission and would benefit a critical mass of members um, to sort of like nudge towards adoption. And then there's a, the other piece of saying like, okay, so. You know, in terms of what is what is kind of a worthwhile use of activism time, right? Sort of saying, okay, if, if there's potential here, moving towards having the that, you know, saying like, okay, well, you know, run run for the board of directors and be sort of part of that group that helps define define the strategic direction of the organization. Um, the other the other thing that I think, and this is kind of where my energy has moved as I've kind of spent many years thinking about this and thinking about cooperative finance and sort of how do we build financial structures that are generative of an economy that 
works for everybody, um, is sort of thinking in terms of kind of ecosystem building, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's not not relying on a single institution, whether it's you know a bank or credit union or anything like that, but recognizing that if you have you know, several different types of institutions that can play different roles and take on different levels of risk um, or prove things to a certain extent to which a larger institution is, it no longer views it as, as entirely risky and untested, um, that that can kind of allow you to sort of in a stepwise way um, bring sort of these alternative ideas closer into the mainstream to the point where they can feel adoptable. So an example of that um, was kind of that, you know, when I was first starting out, I was like, oh, well, credit unions are cooperatives. They should be investing in other cooperatives, da, 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 da. and most of them were just like, oh, we have a lot of this regulatory stuff, et cetera. Um, so a group of us created a, um, a cooperative investment club, which there's kind of a carve out in, in the law um, that regulates kind of investment companies, where if you get a group of under 100 your people, you don't pay anyone to make decisions for you, and you no one owns more than 25% of it, you just create an LLC, you can all put money into a pot and then vote on where to sort of invest that money, right? And so kind of having something where it says, okay, well, you know, this becomes kind of an incubator for other projects, that then we can sort of, okay, well, here's these other projects, it has kind of the, the high risk first, first money is in. Um, will you come on as the mortgage lender? Will you come on as the, the equity investor? Things like that. Um, and then, you know, and sim similarly kind of like out of that, there's a group where we're sort of trying to create a real estate cooperative that will sort of be a consumer co-op that holds and rents real estate to, to its members. Um, but I, I, see, I see in general sort of the strategy being that it's, it's something where you can either kind of go in the direction of, okay, we want to like capture capture an institution and sort of redirect it, or at least kind of build, if not capture, build significant influence and redirect it towards these sorts of projects. Or you sort of like complement that with doing, doing the things you want to see on a smaller scale, but in a way that sort of can influence the direction of these sorts of institutions. So that's kind of, kind of in terms of my thinking about how to, how to engage, um, you know, that's, that's key. Um, and then there's also the sort of policy question of, okay, what are the things that limit the autonomy of these kinds of organizations that theoretically are able to really work for us, like these credit unions, right? And sort of pushing on the, and providing and kind of aid on that policy perspective to say, hey, wouldn't it be nice if that business lending cap was raised or didn't exist? Um, you know, wouldn't it be, would it, wouldn't it be interesting from that ecosystem building perspective if you were allowed to create an un unfederally insured state chartered credit union that would have to be able to be a lot more flexible in terms of what it could do. So, so, you know, nudging, nudging the laws in that direction. And then like, even on the state bank front right now, the, the, uh, the state treasurer is not allowed to use credit unions as a depository for state funds, despite the fact that, you know, you know, they can deposit money in TD bank, yeah. but they can't deposit money in the, in BSECU, which is owned exclusively by Vermonters on a cooperative basis. Yeah. So I see that as actually one fairly low hanging fruit thing that, you know, on the sort of kind of from the impetus of the state bank style thing of just being like, look, there's a huge, huge amount of depository dollars. Those depository dollars would still be federally insured, but there's just a law in place that says the trucker can't put that money in credit unions. You know, I think that to me, that's that's something that with a little bit of pushing could be uh, taken out of the way and could have a potentially significant impact. Well, so those are kind of a, just a few thoughts of how, you know, from that sort of strategic perspective, how you sort of move institutions in this direction. Well, that opens up a, uh, a very big question, which is, and, and I thought I was right here, and I'm getting different opinions from different credit union people and the Bank of North Dakota, the same kind of fuzzy information back, if you're not chartered by the federal government, why, why can't Vermont put money in the Vermont State Employees Credit Union? What is stopping them other than this kind of, oh my God, I can't cross the double line on the highway. What, what, well, what's I mean, stopping them? That's, uh, so, so, so there's, one is the, the existing law. But of course, if there's an existing law, what's what's the barrier to changing the law? And the barrier to changing the law is, you know, the existing banks and you know they have a lobbyist. Would that's something that they would definitely put 
political capital into opposing, right? Oh, sure. Well, so, I, I've so, gone head to head with those people. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so to, to me, that's the kind of, you know, but I think it's, it's also just the sort of question of, all right, what, is there the political will? Is there a sort of, and in many cases with those sorts of like small, regu- wonky regulatory changes that 95% of people wouldn't hear about, about or really care about, right? It's just sort of having a, having a sort of group, a coalition of people sort of decide that that's, that's a piece on the chessboard we want to move, mm-hmm. um, and then putting the putting the the effort and horsepower into into making it move. Okay, so you're saying that even though the Vermont State the, the Vermont State Employees Credit Union is not chartered by the federal government, there is a law prohibiting <laughs> them from, from receiving state putting money uh, into the, the putting the state of Vermont the, prohibiting the state of Vermont from putting money into the credit union. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, there seem to be some laws that, if you're connected to the federal government, apply to you. If you're mm-hmm. not connected to the federal government through the FDIC and all that, those laws don't apply to you. But am I making that idea up? I mean, there's probably some some stuff there, but like in terms of what, in terms of the specific barrier that that exists to sort of like taking that action, it's. My understanding is it's just, you know, it would need a, a change to the Vermont statutes, and then the treasurer would have the power to do that if, if she oh, wanted. Because okay. right now she's just putting it in, like, TD Bank. Oh, yeah. Right? That's the major bank for the state right now. Yeah, well, we went head-to-head with her for a long time, and we won. We got the 10% for Vermont, and different money is, is indeed not, – it's not all going into TD Bank now. Mm-hmm. And, unless, right. Yeah, it's being sort of unless distributed a little bit more. In the meantime, but um, we had a long fight with that, and we had a partial victory with this thing called ten percent for Vermont. Mm-hmm. And um, but still, she would be it would be against Vermont law, but not federal law, to put state money in a credit union. Right. Okay. So the next activist movement that you and I and, you know, Gwen Hall-Smith and John Ford and that crowd could get involved in would be changing the Vermont law to allow the state to deposit money in a credit union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to me, and and that's something that even in the broader co-op movement in terms of, okay, if there's, if there's a general sort of legislative push to be like, hey, let's update the consumer co-op statute and the worker co-op statute and other things like that. You know, if, if there's a coalition that could come together saying like, this is the, you know, the five bullet points of the, the, the Vermont co-op movement would like as our legislative wish list, mm-hmm. you know, that could be, you know, that, that could bring a lot of folks to the table who might not, who might not even be sort, sort of this would be outside of their general sort of purview of what they're thinking about, sure. um, but would, would be a way to kind of combine the political capital of a bunch of different different groups to okay. sort of accomplish this. And then Chris D'Elia would have an earthquake in his head. And then yeah, he would, he he would, would not be pleased by that. Volcano, <laughs> a volcano would come out of his head if, if that started to make progress through the legislature, which some of our things did make a lot of progress, and then they were... I could say mysteriously to be polite, but there was a certain amount of corruption involved whereby I mean, the yeah, there, there, there's the, a, the a chair, lot of ways. It's a complicated multi-step process, and there's a lot of steps in that process that, it, that things can get derailed, right? Yeah. Through procedural things too, well, right? <laughs> we followed them. You know, we, we, we yeah. followed our, our study bill from the, appropriate, from the um, government ops to finance and whoops, it didn't get passed along to appropriations, and there's no reason. Oh, we don't know. It just didn't get passed along. Right. Well, I know I mean, in why. Ter- in terms of things that I see as, you know, kind of low-hanging fruit that are, you know, it's not something that would be totally earth-shattering, mm-hmm. um, it would, you know, but it's, it's more of an incremental reform, but nonetheless could have a significant impact on, yeah. you know, shifting the balance of power of the sort of finance, like where... The financial power of the state is deployed. Like to me, I see this as kind of as one of those ones that that feels winnable. Well, we we won five to nothing in one committee, six to one in another committee, and then it wasn't passed on. So we had a huge victory, except that there's the the corruption occurred from the chair 
of the committee not passing it on to the next committee, which has to do with the treasurer and him. And uh, I, I guess a little arm twisting from somebody who's sort of in the shadows. And I would mm -hmm. assume that that would be the uh, lobbyist from the state. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I've already said his the, name, but I, I won't say it again because we it's, it's don't want Orca like, to be yeah, sued. The, the, I've, been, I've been through the through the legislative process on some things. And even and even, even when it's like a fairly uncontroversial thing yeah. where there's no one really opposing it, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's all about kind of getting, you know, getting momentum and getting people for, who have a sense of ownership of the thing going through. Yeah. Because otherwise it's just like, okay, we have all these things on the wall. Which ones are just, which ones should we put attention to and which ones can we just let drop, right? Yeah. So right. it's, <laughs> it's a process. Yeah. Well, we've been, like, we, we've both been there and um, talk about low hanging fruit. I mean, the things that we <clears throat> gave up on because it was too high up on the tree. Um, and the things that we then focused on were so obvious and so beneficial to the state, and they still didn't get them. They were still ordered to lie, or they were <clears throat> somehow not passed on. But the actual people in the legislature were very helpful, and we, you know, we got pretty far. Mm -hmm. But somehow there's a, a little corruption here and there, and mysteriously these things don't go forward. <clears throat> and you've just explained why. A little bit of momentum mm -hmm. in in the direction that would benefit the public right. is very upsetting to the bank lobby. <laughs> so that's that seems to be what has happened. And by the way, I love your word there. You you either capture the institution or you compliment the institution. And um, I've been often thinking of running for the board of the Vermont Employees Credit Union. Mm -hmm. um, but my, yeah, I that, don't have the yeah, time. That's one where, you know, with the, um, a lot of credit unions, as they merged, sort of the board elections became a formality. But, you know, VSCCU, for complicated reasons, mm -hmm. um, has actually been able to maintain a pretty sort of open system where they, you know, actively encourage folks to run. And there's usually more candidates than seats, which is like for, you know, a democratic organization is definitely a sign of health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those would be the things that, the, the, what we've talked about today are the things that would help a community. Now, mm -hmm. here's a political hot potato for you. Let me see what kind of time we have here. Whoops. Oh. Well, yeah, we're, we're I just, at 11.07, so I'll need to. No, it's, it's not 9.11 today. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll need to jump off fairly soon. OK. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, if you want to throw me, throw oh, me one more right. question. It's, uh, yeah, 11.08. So um, VIDA, the Vermont Economic Development Association, I've been in there. I've spoken to her. She doesn't know what a bank is, but she claims to be the Vermont State Bank. And um, it's been a very frustrating process. And I've almost come to the conclusion that it's an irrelevant institution. They, they deal with pass-through money only. They, they take money, and they lend what they've taken, and then they take a cut. So. If, if I wanted to borrow something, I would certainly go to a credit union first. I'd, mm -hmm. And I'm a lender personally. I own, I'm part owner of two environmental companies in Vermont. Um, one is AgriLab that turns heat, that, um, compost heat, heat into usable heat, and Landstream, which is working to <clears throat> grow soil and prevent erosion and purify Lake Champlain, and stuff like that. So that's just my money being lent. Well, that's all VITA does. It takes money from the state and lends that money out. So mm -hmm. what's, what's and the... It, all, it takes money from the state, and then it also sort of accesses national level capital markets. Oh. And I think that's sort of its, um, it's kind of like key pieces that it's, it's almost like a, the state as a bulk buyer of um, sort of, you know, credit from, so it says, all right, we're going to get, you know, this, this money at 3%, and then we can sort of relend it you know, at a lower rate than it would than would be it would it would be if it was like probably sourced from you know deposits or investments internally. Mm -hmm. um, so so that has been my understanding of kind of their sort of their role. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, but it's usually with the loans they make, it's it's usually something where they'll basically buy down. You know, so maybe a conventional lender will lend fifty percent, Vita will lend forty percent, and then 
you know, the, the entrepreneur or something, it's like 10% down. So it kind of like, you know, is a, is a play at reducing the cost of capital for people kind of starting businesses and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we've definitely been, um, you know, with the, the work I do around the conversion of businesses to employee owners, um, they're being passed by the legislature in 2006, 2007, kind of, you know, instructing them to give priority to, to lending to those sorts of um, kind of deals. Um, you know, and it's been, you know, we've, we've had a few examples where they've kind of come in and bought a little sort of piece of a loan. The, the new school of Montpelier example I brought up earlier was one where they put in a little, a little mm -hmm. loan as kind of a piece of the financing puzzle. Um, but you know, certainly that's something where I think there's, there's plenty of room to sort of con continue to kind of have pressure on them to, to, you know, to sort of have more, more programs and more focused kind of stuff on really sorts of things that are building a sustainable and kind of just economy here. Okay. So if somebody had a project that was obviously for the public good, well, I shouldn't say obviously because that's a matter of opinion, um, that y you personally and the co-op situations that you're in um, thought was worthy, how, how would that person come to you? How would that so, work? So, so there's a few kind of different different avenues, right? So if it's something where someone's starting a general, you know, a co-op generally, um, probably the, you know, or a consumer co-op or something like that, the, um, uh, the Vermont Solidarity Investment Club or Investing Club is sort of the group that we've got together that's everyone puts in between 20 or $200 a month and then the aggregated money, you know, we, we vote on to invest in cooperative projects specifically. Um, if folks are interested in employee ownership, um, you know, I, I'm the, I work with the Vermont Employee Ownership Center, which is a nonprofit that provides kind of education assistance and has a small revolving loan fund as well. Um, so like a worker cooperative or an employee stock ownership plan for, for a company. Um, so VEOC.org is how to kind of find out more about that. V, um, say that again? VEOC.org, the okay. Vermont Employee Ownership Center. Okay. So, and yeah, it's certainly, you are in the midst of starting this real estate co-op. So the, a lot of my work has been around this building an ecosystem of different players or different types of institutions that can kind of help make it easier for these sorts of businesses to both get going and to expand and to convert and, and all of that in terms of how we organize capital, mm -hmm. um, sort of on a, you know, on a generative basis rather than an extractive one. Okay. So you would put yourself, you'd, you'd put your, the hat on that evaluated the viability of a pro the financial viability of a project <laughs> as well as the social viability right. of a project. Yeah. All right. And if you thought that there was a reasonable chance that the money would come back to you, and if you liked it for social reasons, then you would talk further with the entrepreneur or entrepreneurs, or if you like the French, entrepreneurs, if it's female, um, then um, that would be a discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about what are the what are the kind of resources and players in the in the broader field here that could uh, could kind of into into helping make make something like that happen. Okay. The, because several Vermont movies have been made, and you may know that we just finished. We have one playing now in Vermont called. Made in Vermont. Have you heard of it? I've not, but I should look it up. Okay. Yeah, the trailer is available. I, I'll, I can send you the trailer, but it's played in Burlington and Montpelier and St. Johnsbury and Middlebury, and I think it's coming to Waterbury. I'm not sure about that. Uh, that's an LLC paid for by those of us who made the movie. Mm -hmm. And it was very low cost because everybody volunteered time. And there's actually um, some reason to believe that we might almost break even, even if we stopped soon with that. Um, anyway, but, but that's the kind of thing somebody could come with his hat in his hand and say, um, Matthew, here's another movie that we're going to make. What do you think? And the, the sort of things that I'm particularly interested in are things that are, are structured as cooperatives, mm -hmm. right? So, so. You know, and I can. There's certainly a broader, broader ecosystem of, of um, things that are that that 
or for that general kind of you know things that have social good but in terms of my personal sort of interests it's really around that right does this create sort of broad-based democratic ownership um mm -hmm. in a, or is it structured in a way that, that does that amongst the participants so mm -hmm. so that's the, in terms of things that i really geek out out about and get excited about that's the core for me well a movie could be structured exactly like that right mm -hmm. yeah there's there's cooperative media companies and things like that so yeah all right. Well, I'll be in touch. <laughs> I'll be in touch regarding our next one, if only to pick your brain. But, For sure. But I don't right, well, know. Looks, that... looks like I've got a uh, call coming in. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, your guest has been Matt Kropp. This is The House at Pooh Corner. And um, we have uh, four minutes left, but we'll let right, Matt go you. to his call. And thanks a lot, Matthew Kropp. So here we are. And I don't know whether um, you want me to wrap this up for four minutes. OK, I will keep doing that. Uh, so your guest was Matthew Kropp. He's an expert in credit unions. And we're very happy to have him on today because I personally had a lot of questions about what credit unions do, how they started, and what they might be able to do in the future. And Matt was uh, very helpful in answering those questions. And when you see it on YouTube, which you are doing right now, I would advise you, if you had questions, play it again. Because uh, he, he pretty much answered a lot of the tricky things that credit unions actually do, actually can do, but maybe don't, and might be able to do in the future. And it's pretty exciting when you think of how some of these activities that a credit union can sponsor and actually do are generally helpful to the community. And the exact opposite occurs with commercial banks because they can only invest in something that they know or are reasonably sure will pay them back. And so um, this has been a very interesting conversation for me as I learned some of the possibilities. And uh, the time is two minutes. And OK, we have three minutes. So uh, let me go on to tell you what I'm working on and how I'm going to be continuing these discussions about monetary reform and what has happened over the last several hundred years when it comes to the creation of money and what that money has been used for. Uh, as you may have heard me say at the beginning of this program, I'm writing a paper now called All Wars Are Bankers' Wars. And I'm calling it that because there is a uh, financial aspect to every military adventure, because be we live in a world of debt money. That's an Another discussion we've had several times, actually. Um, money is in existence because it was lent into existence in the Western world since 1694. And when a bank sees an opportunity to make money, it doesn't matter whether it's sarin gas or the F-35 or whatever it is. If a bank can lend money and be certain reasonably certain that that money is coming back, then that's what the bank will do. And in the case of wars, banks lend on both sides frequently. And the side that loses has to pay reparations. And guess where those reparations go? To the bank. And maybe something else as well. But reparations to, uh, from the loser go to the bank, and from the winner, well, guess what they do after they get paid back? Then they send their constabulary. Their constabulary has already destroyed a country. Now they send their constabulary and their businesses in to rebuild the country. So that's a very simple and accurate way of describing how banks make trillions of dollars by creating the war fighting the war, and rebuilding the country. There's a lot of money in that. And it doesn't help you, and it doesn't help me. You'll hear the 
that crap out there that war is good for the economy. It is not. It destroys the economy. It builds the military industrial complex. It builds up the arms manufacturers and it builds up the banks. But it doesn't help you and it doesn't help me. Not to mention the fact that it kills people and destroys cultures. Uh, checking the time. Here we are. Thanks for listening to the House of Pooh Corner with Jim Hogue. Bye-bye.